Dear friends and colleagues, welcome to the third and final workshop of this virtual edition of the Monaco Blue Initiative. My name is Lina Hansen. I'm with the Michelle Bucke Second of Monaco Foundation. And um, next to me is my colleague, Pierre Gilles, from the Oceanographic Institute, Michelle Bucke First of Monaco Foundation. Pierre and I are delighted to be here again today to facilitate the last workshop in this series. This is the first time that the Monaco Blue Initiative takes place in a digital format. It was the wish of His Serene Highness, Prince Albert II of Monaco, and the steering committee of the Monaco Blue Initiative to maintain the momentum on the topics planned to be discussed of the Canadian MBI, which, as you know, could not take place in Monaco earlier this year due to the pandemic. Of course, these online sessions also provide an opportunity to think about these topics in light of the crisis that we are currently facing. We are confident that through our collective efforts and networks, the messages arising from these workshops will reach the high-level meetings of the 2020 Ocean Agenda, many of it which, of course, have been postponed to next year. So on behalf of the organizers, His Excellency Mr. Bernard Coutillier, Minister of the 20th Century and Special Advisor to His Serene Highness, the Sovereign Kings for Environment, Mr. Robert Calcagno, CEO of the Oceanographic Institute, and Mr. Olivier Wendel, Vice President of the Prince Albert II and Monaco Foundation. I would like to thank all of you for participating in today's workshop and extend a very special thanks to our prominent speakers, of course. We are also very grateful to our partner Rolex for the continued support to the MBI. Today's workshop is the third and last of this digital MBI. If you missed the two previous workshops, the recordings are available on the MBI website. And also stay tuned for update, updates to that page as we will soon add more products from all three sessions, such as the MBI summaries produced by our conference writer, Amy Bell. Before diving into the discussions, we suggest to have a quick look at today's agenda. First, we will have the privilege of listening to a keynote speech by Mr. Jens Solish Holte, State Secretary, Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Then there will be a 50 minutes, 50 minutes discussion between the panelists, moderated by Ms. Nina Jensen, CEO of, of uh, Red Ocean. We will then open the floor to participants to ask questions to the panel. Please use the questions pane to submit any question you may have. Before closing this workshop, Mr. Wenden and Mr. Calcagno will provide some final work. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to warmly welcome Mr. Jens Kralisch Holte, State Secretary, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Norway. Please, Mr. Holte. Thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, dear. Uh, friends um, of the ocean. I'm very happy that we are um, able to meet uh, digitally. Um, I am uh, personally very excited to, to talk to you um, uh, today. Uh, I can also report that uh, Oslo uh, currently has temperatures to match Monaco uh, today, and I'm very much looking forward to going swimming in the Oslo fjord uh, later. Um, I'd really like to commend um, uh, the phrasing uh, of today's discussion, um, carefully selected words by Monaco Blue Initiative, instead of asking whether the blue economy and sustainable ocean management can be reconciled, um, you're asking how. Um, and I couldn't agree more. There is really no question mark uh, that needs to be attached to this uh, connection. In a world where more than 1 billion people rely on seafood as their primary source of animal protein and essential micronutrients, and where 30 million people derive their employment from ocean-based industries, uh, we cannot afford not to reconcile the blue economy with sustainable ocean management. Just consider this. Fish is one of the most traded food commodities globally. We know that 90% of world trade uses sea routes, Two out of three small island development states rely on coastal tourism for over 20% of the GDP. And because now of the, because of the pandemic, many of them are now faced with total economic collapse. So in every challenge, there is an opportunity and we must use this opportunity to gear 
our ocean industries uh, towards greater uh, sustainability. The ocean provides critical functions and ecosystem services that our industries rely on. You know, what tourism operator can survive if beaches are littered with plastic debris and if snorkelers are only swimming um, along, among bleached coral reefs or raw sewage? And which fishing fleet can continue operating if stocks are collapsing due to overfishing and climate change? The future of the blue economy must be tied to sustainable ocean management. For instance, large-scale fisheries must be based on science and knowledge to ensure good management. We have done so in Norway over many decades. Uh, we did experience, um, some decades ago, a collapse in the herring stocks. We established precautionary management where politicians base decisions uh, upon scientific advice. And today, Norway is the second largest, largest exporter of fish in the world. Recently, uh, we also uh, banned fishing for cod around uh, Oslo. Uh, and we were expecting a lot of um, angry uh, fishermen and recreational fishers. Um, but we saw very little of that. People accepted it. Um, we had a clear scientific basis for our management decision. Uh, which also highlights the need for legitimacy and also popular support for your management uh, schemes. But now we're all waiting for the COD uh, to return to the Oslo Fjord, and I think uh, people are willing to wait for the good stuff. Um, the high-level panel on the sustainable ocean economy, which uh, Norwegian Prime Minister Anna Solberg initiated in 2018, works precisely to increase the understanding of the connection between production and protection and to show the benefit of a sustainable ocean uh, to as many people as possible. We have got some interesting reports uh, from the panel. Um, one uh, uh, research report shows that um, uh, we can deliver up to one-fifth of the emission cuts needed to meet the Paris targets through climate-based ocean action. That's equivalent to taking one billion cars off the road each year. Another report shows that the ocean has the potential to produce up to uh, several times uh, the amount of seafood as it does today. And we also know that the costs of inaction are daunting. Uh, the UNDP estimated in 2012 uh, that the cumulative economic impact of poor ocean management practices were an order of US dollars 200 billion per year. Um, and we can only imagine how an updated number would look like. So we need these hard economic facts uh, to hit people uh, on the head, uh, hard if necessary, um, and hard numbers uh, can really be uh, put to good use in that way. But we also need to point at good models for regulating the competing demands of the ocean. Luckily, we know where to look. The key word is sustainable ocean management. Ecosystem-based integrated ocean management it's a very long word, but it's a very good thing. Marine spatial planning uh, is a very commonly used tool and a very good model for uh, reconciling uh, uh, economic growth with environmental uh, concerns. Um, and um, also uh, spatial or sector-based management uh, is also a very important tool in the, in the toolkit. And then, of course, you need these processes of management to be uh, legitimate and, and inclusive and uh, transparent. Uh, so that people affected by the management also have a say in how it's designed. In Norway, we have used knowledge-based ocean management plans uh, for close to 20 years. The system has served us very well. And today, over 30% of the value creation in the private sector and two-thirds of our export value stem from ocean-based industries. At the Our Ocean Conference last year, the Norwegian government launched a new program called Oceans for uh, Development. Uh, the program will contribute to a sustainable and inclusive ocean economy uh, through capacity development uh, with institutional cooperation between Norway and partner countries. In short, we want more countries uh, to come up with um, management plans for their oceans so that we can really um, uh, get uh, some, uh, some good practices and some order and some ecosystem improvements in uh, areas where there's currently uh, no such uh, thing. So this kind of integrated approach, we, uh, we really need to, to keep pushing it in order to reap the benefits of the ocean. Uh, all the important international processes that 
now have, has been a bit delayed because of COVID-19. Uh, our Ocean Conference and the UN Ocean Conference Biodiversity Conference COP26, UN Decade of Ocean Science. There's a lot of processes, but we need to really place the connection between uh, effective production um, and protection and prosperity at the heart of what we do. Um, integrated ocean management, uh, it's maybe not a vote winner or something that will create headlines, but it's an extremely effective way of both ensuring sustainable production and also protecting our vulnerable ecosystems. So I'm really looking forward to following the discussions today and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, State Secretary Jose, for our wonderful keynote to kick off this workshop. We will now proceed with today's panel discussion on the topic, how can blue economy and sustainable management of the ocean in the fields such as tourism, travel, therapy, fishing, and aquaculture be reconciled? We will enjoy listening to yet another extraordinary panel of speakers lined up today. Our panel will be moderated by Ms. Nina Ye Jensen, CEO Red Ocean. Thank you so much, Nina. And on the panel, we have Professor Carl Pouke, Director, Bay Institute and Stockholm Resilience Center. Dr. Watson Daud, Head for Corporate Social Responsibility and Sustainability, Conan. Ms. Maren Jot Bauer, Co founder of Catapult Ocean. Dr. Hugo Tagol, Chief Executive, Surface Against Sewage, and also an Edinburgh 2020 Ocean Leader. And Mr. Rupert House, CEO, Marine Stewardship Council. A very warm welcome, and thank you to all our panelists. A word to the participants before starting. Please feel free to submit any questions you have as they come up when listening to the panel. And with that, I will give the floor to Nina. Please, Nina, the floor is yours. Oh, the sound. Okay. Yeah, that's also Nicole. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Nina, we will unmute you. Here we go. Thank you, Lena, for that kind introduction uh, and also to the State uh, Secretary for framing uh, the topic uh, of today uh, so nicely. Um, so, Your Excellencies, ocean enthusiasts, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is, uh, of course, my great pleasure to be leading this important panel discussion uh, today on how the blue economy and sustainable management of the ocean can be uh, reconciled. Uh, First of all, a huge thank you to His uh, Serene Highness uh, Prince Albert uh, and the Monaco Blue Initiative uh, for hosting uh, the series of uh, workshops. Uh, your leadership on ocean uh, issues uh, cannot be uh, overestimated and is highly uh, valued. Without the sea and the complex ecosystems that she supports, uh, life on Earth uh, simply would not uh, exist. All life on this planet uh, originated uh, from the ocean. And the ocean provides us with uh, oxygen, with food, it regulates our climate, it provides inspiration and jobs, and of course holds endless opportunities for economic development if we manage it well. And that's the blue economy in practice, uh, developing sustainable economic opportunities whilst protecting, restoring, and sustainably managing our ocean for the benefit of all. And to discuss this important uh, topic, we have uh, an eminent panel, as you will see in front of you. Uh, and we will start uh, today's discussion uh, with uh, Professor Carl Folke. Carl is the director of the Bayer Institute and founder and science director of the Stockholm Resilience Center. Carl has produced around 300 publications, including 14 books. And since the mid 1980s, uh, he has broken new grounds in understanding the dynamic interplay of humans and nature, economy and ecology. So Carl, I figured it would be great to start with uh, you telling us what is the blue economy seen uh, with your eyes? 
Thank you very much, uh, Nina. And, uh, very nice to be here in, in this uh, panel and in this seminar. Uh, and uh, yes, I think we are in the Anthropocene. I think many of you may have heard and know what that means, but it's basically for the first time in our history, we have become a dominant force shaping the whole planet, uh, not just locally and regionally, but at the level of the operation of the whole planet. <clears throat> that is also true for the oceans, actually. They, the last couple of years, there have been several publications now really illustrating the Anthropocene ocean. In that context, we were asking ourselves, could there be players in the human society that actually have the capacity and power to, to shape the oceans? Uh, we started to dive into that and, um, uh, and, and discovered actually that uh, there were 13 big transnational comp companies that are actually shaping uh, the oceans in terms of food webs through fishing and, and aquaculture. Uh, we, we call them keystone actors. And that was a thing, something we published in 2015. Uh, the reason for looking into that was basically to figure out, could, could we find any leverage points uh, where we could tip the current development, which actually won't work. We can't do the same thing we've been doing since the Second World War up to now for a population of nine to 10 billion, we have to redirect the way we operate into sustainable pathways. And, and can, we do, can we find those leverage points? And I think that uh, what we tried to do with these Keystone actors was exactly that. Since then, we started a dialogue with, uh, with them and 10 of them now are around the table, uh, uh, trying to move the whole thing forward. And, and just a uh, little, little time back, I can mention some of them. They, they, they have about uh, up to 15% of the global catch, these 10 company, uh, these 13 companies. They catch about 200 species in 100 countries, uh, about 20 to 40% of the most valuable stocks, and 35% of salmon aquaculture, 40% of tuna. They dominate segments of all seafood production about 1,000 subsidiaries and are deeply involved in shaping policy and, and practice, actually. Uh, we, we were successful in getting uh, 10 of them around the table. And actually, we had the first dialogue that also Rupert was part of. And we also have people like Jane Lubchenko that some of you may know, and, and also our Royal, her Royal Highness of, of Sweden, Princess um, Victoria, who's been really engaged in this and still, and still is. Since 2015, we had some 270 meetings with these companies, including seven bigger, what we call CU dialogues, at the level of CUs and working meetings. Uh, so this is not a sort of a, an initiative of only the companies. It's a very strong science business collaboration, quite a unique one, I think, actually, where we as scientists sum up state of the art of the situation and, and sort of push the companies to try to act in that direction. So what has happened today? You could say what, what's going on here is a big change in mindset from, from looking at themselves as producer of, of seafood to really move into how can you produce seafood sustainably and, and now shifting into a realization of, of that sustainable seafood requires healthy oceans. So, so, so we really see that they are now starting to move from an idea of compliance to a conviction that healthy oceans are a precondition for, for good seafood production already now and especially into the future. The other major breakthrough that happened was a year ago when actually the, these companies together with us established a new form of organization which we call the CBOS initiative. It stands for Seafood Business for Ocean Stewardship. Uh, it's a loose network, but uh, but there's a lot of things happening there. Uh, earlier, for example, the sustainability concept didn't exist in some of those countries, especially for the Japanese, their companies. Uh, uh, but now they are actively work, working with sustainability reporting, and all of those companies from uh, Thailand and and uh, South Korea are now implementing K K K I S and other and other type of efforts. For moving forward. The way we operate the whole thing is through task forces. Currently we have 
task forces on IUU, forced labor, traceability, transparency, working with policy governments, plastic issues, climate resilience, and we're also discussing antimicrobial resistance and antibiotic use. So basically, you could say that uh, the CBOS, and this is my last point, sir, um, are operating in four steps. In, in the first step, it's about cleaning up your act to own your right to speak. And I think that's where we are still, basically to really create uh, sustainable supply chains or sustainable ways of operating and in a very transparent way. The second one is to partner with a lot of other organizations and that also of course happening. The third is, is actually to become a source of inspiration for others. And, and I know that the high level panel and, and the UN uh, Global Compact on, on um, the action pl platform for sustainable ocean businesses have looked very much into the CBOS model uh, as a way to operate and, and uh, having ocean stewardship as, as, as a way forward for healthy oceans. And the fourth one is really to dive into this stewardship challenge, which obviously linked to an ecosystem approach, but not just the ecosystem, but people and ecosystems together. So, that, so that's a little bit of, of a quick summary overview of, of this initiative we're trying to do with, with these 10 companies that if, if we are successful, that we hope will create cascading effects through the whole seafood sector and shift it over into sustainable use and healthy oceans. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carl. And I think the CBOS uh, initiative has been uh, an inspiration to many of us and, uh, and also potentially um, holds great potential for being replicated and scaled also for, for other industries, which uh, is uh, hopefully an excellent segue over to uh, Dr. Wasim Daoud, uh, who's the head of uh, sustainability and CSR of Panant uh, Cruise Company and Panant Foundation officer. Um, Wasim is a creative uh, boundary pusher and sea lover and embodies that uh, innovation that in instigates positive environmental and social change for a sustainable and reasonable tourism. Uh, so Wasim, um, can you find some inspiration in what you just heard uh, from, uh, from Carl? And also how can activities and practices of the tourism industry be adapted uh, to the capacity of the natural environment? Yes, uh, thank you, Nina, for this uh, introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, dear ocean lovers, I'm very happy to participate to this uh, digital edition of the Monaco Blue Initiative. Uh, first of all, rapidly in my own name and my and the name of my company, Ponon, I would like to thank uh, His Serene Highness Prince Albert, the Oceanographic Institute, the Prince Albert of Monaco Foundation, Nina, Lina, Pierre, other organizers, the participants, and my co-panelists, of course. Uh, this initiative for me is a good way to bring together ocean lovers during a difficult period, which necessitates more collaboration and solidarity, and I'm sure more sustainability. Um, let me introduce briefly Ponant, because I don't know if other people uh, know my, my company. Uh, our company is the world leader in luxury expeditions and the only French-owned cruise line. Uh, Bruno was created in 1998 by our CEO, Jean-Emmanuel Sauvé, and a dozen of French Navy officers. Today, Bruno's is leading the way with a new style of cruising through a unique conception of sea travel, which combines exceptional itineraries about smaller scale ships and sustainable tourism. We are convinced that uh, tourism plays a key role in the blue economy. You know, tourism is one of the world's largest industries, uh, contributing trillions of euros uh, to the global economy and supporting the livelihoods of an estimated one in 10 people worldwide. And coastal and marine tourism represents a significant share of the industry and is an important component of the growing sustainable blue economy supporting more than 6 million jobs, uh, second only to industrial fishing. 
uh, with anticipated global growth, uh, we estimate that coastal and marine tourism uh, is projected to be largest value adding segment of the ocean economy by 2030 at 25%. At Ponant, we have a strong sustainable strategy which combine environmental protection, social and cultural preservation, and economical development. Our itineraries are designed in consultation with local population in order to take into account the natural areas, the social specification, the cultural heritage, and economical needs. I can introduce you some of our main action in uh, sustainability. Uh, for example, our ships have a limited capacity, around 200 passengers. Uh, we are using the cleanest available fuel around the world. We have catalytic converters to filter the air emissions. All the waters used on board are treated and recycled. All the wastes are sorted for recycling and treatment. 70% of our fruits and vegetables are supplied locally. We support number of natural conservation projects around the world. We promote circular economy with the donation of our furniture to social associations. We offset 150% of our carbon emissions and we collaborate, collaborate with suppliers and startups to develop new green technologies. Uh, I cannot detail all our actions, but uh, I invite you to visit our website to learn more about our sustainable strategy, and I will be happy to, to answer a more questions later. In my opinion, we can develop blue economy and take care about our planet and human rights and expectation. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to contact me if you like, and I will be happy to discuss the potential collaboration we can initiate. Uh, I can join um, our, our, my, my co-panelist, Carl Volker. Let's work together to create maybe the blue value chain, you know, our sustainable blue value chain. I think it's the time to initiate that. And I can wish you good luck for, for all the people and participants for this difficult period, I think, for a lot of people. It's okay for me. I I, I will be I will be happy to answer the, the, the question, maybe uh, some question later. Thank you uh, again, Nina. Thank you so much, uh, Wasim, and I'm sure we will have a flow of uh, questions uh, coming uh, at the end of this uh, session. Uh, but just one uh, additional one for you before we move on uh, to our next speaker. Obviously, we're in uh, a challenging time with uh, the COVID-19 uh, and uh, the tourism industry uh, has been impacted particularly hard. Can you share a few uh, very short reflections uh, on how this has impacted the tourism industry in particular and also uh, efforts linked to uh, sustainability and the blue economy? Yeah, it's a good question. Thank you. Uh, I think that we have um, a good period to think about the future of tourism because now we we saw that the, the mind of a number of uh, of customers is um, in um, total um, modification. Why? Because they are thinking now about the sustainability as um, um, an as as an obligation as a, a mandatory for uh, the future of tourism. So we have to do more efforts. We have to do, um, we have to think more about our uh, impacts uh, and not only the health uh, impact, but also the environmental impacts in our activity. Uh, for example, for us now uh, to, be, to, to be able to uh, respond to this situation, we uh, designed specific cruises around France, around uh, you know close areas, to be uh, more uh, close to our customers and without uh, a lot of uh, transportation. You know, so we uh, improved our sanitary uh, protocol, but also we designed different types of cruises. Uh, what are what was maybe what were maybe impossible in the past and now we had um, 
a good feedback from our customers. You know, we launched only last week uh, French cruises, for example, around France, and we have a very good feedback from our customers uh, about this new idea. So we have to be innovative and to think differently and to include sustainability in our, our, in our tourism um, conception. Thank you so much, uh, Wasim. Definitely an inspiration to see that some positive things can also uh, come out from uh, from a difficult uh, situation. Um, our next uh, panelist is Mr. Hugo uh, Tagholm, uh, and he is the chief executive of Surfers Against Sewage, a leading force in UK marine conservation that uh, takes action from the beachfront to the front benches of Parliament actually mobilizes over a hundred thousand ocean conservation volunteers annually and has been instrumental in uh, helping introduce and enforce new government uh, legislation to protect our seas. Um, so Hugo, from your uh, perspective, um, how can the blue economy uh, contribute to the development of uh, coastal communities and, and what are your reflections on the importance of the blue economy? Participate today. Um, thanks to the Prince Albert of Monaco Foundation and to the Oceanographic Museum of Monaco. And I'd also like to thank the Edinburgh University Ocean Leaders Programme, which I'm proud to represent today. Um, I would like to assert that local and global tourism present a key opportunity to drive the sustainable blue economy. I'll focus on three key points in my talk tourists as global ocean ambassadors, environmental justice, and ocean recovery. Tourism is one of the world's largest industries supporting the livelihoods and local ocean communities globally. Coastal tourism supports millions of jobs and is set to be one of the largest growth sectors of the ocean economy over the next decade. Sustainable ocean tourism can also mobilize a worldwide community of ocean advocates, guardians to celebrate not just the conservation of our ocean, but the restoration of pristine ecosystems and the diverse communities that surround them. As the old adage goes, people protect what they love. Sustainable blue tourism is quite literally a, an immersive experience. Diving, swimming, surfing, sailing, and discovering planet ocean can educate and activate global citizens to join the campaign, to protect our seas in this decade of ecosystem restoration. Tourists are indeed a marine indicator species themselves, becoming acutely aware of the health of our ocean and the witness to damage, pollution and decline where it happens. They will also champion recovering ecosystems and emerging ocean healing business and innovation. A sustainable blue economy depends on an abundant, thriving and complex natural world and diverse local coastal communities, cultures and economies. These are non-negotiables. These are the magnetic forces which attract global audiences to step onto the sand, to plunge into the ocean and to explore the blue wonders of the world. The myriad local ocean communities provide unique and powerful cultural experiences, also of crucial importance to developing a truly sustainable blue economy. This brings me on to environmental justice, which is central to this opportunity bringing together both social justice and environmentalism. It must be used to protect ocean communities from the potential of environmental degradation and inequity that could arise from current dominant economic forces. Local representatives mustn't be drowned out by the biggest voice or the deepest wallet. Local coastal people must be the defenders and primary beneficiaries of recovering and a flourishing ocean. Ocean communities should be highly involved in decision-making, monitoring and restoring the health of our planet's saline engine of life and prosperity. Perhaps we should even reconsider our approach to planning and environmental impact assessments, which currently license incremental damage of ecosystems. Instead, we should introduce local environmental recovery assessments, which demonstrate the natural capital and social gains that any activity delivers both locally and globally. 
No one wants to visit an ocean filled with heavy industry, choking on plastic or devoid of life. We must invest in local ocean tourism as the ultimate advertising campaign to highly protect 30% of our oceans by 2030 and restore blue carbon habitats worldwide. This could create a new global ocean network providing marine restoration opportunities and campaign information to help win hearts and minds in every part of planet ocean. Thank you. Thank you, Hugo. Uh, no doubt a very passionate uh, description of uh, the challenges and, uh, and opportunities. Uh, just an additional question for you before we move uh, on to our next uh, panelist. Uh, obviously, there's a bit of a challenge in bridging uh, multinational or large international uh, companies' interests with local uh, interests that you speak so passionately about. Uh, do you have some suggestions or examples for how uh, this uh, bridge can be developed? It's a, it's a really good question, and I think it's a, a collaborative discussion for us to, to have. I think we do need to see a weighting of, of voices around the table, so, um, uh, so resourcing doesn't necessarily drown out the, the voice of, voices of the local communities involved in, in any part of the, the world. Um, so I would look at sort of a, a, a local sort of ocean sort of council um, that, that could be uh, very influential in planning decisions. Thank you. Uh, and I'm sure there will be uh, a few follow-up questions uh, from our listeners uh, following up from that uh, as well. And uh, part of the resourcing uh, is what our next speaker, I'm sure, will touch upon. Uh, Ms. Marne York bauer is the co-founder and advisor of Catapult Ocean, uh, a venture capital and private equity firm uh, investing in ocean tech uh, startups. And they have become uh, a leading force in building the blue economy globally, having invested in, I think, as much as 22 impact-driven uh, startups from 14 different uh, countries. And Martin is actually one of the most passionate people I know when it comes to helping ambitious startups uh, make a positive impact on our oceans. So Marn, uh, can you share some um, of the success stories from Catapult Ocean, uh, maybe some concrete uh, projects and the positive effects that they have had on the ocean? Uh, thank you, Nina, and thank you to, uh, to, to everyone in the panel and to the foundation and the Institute of Oceanographic for having this virtual edition of the Monaco Blue Initiative. It's important to continue these discussions, even though we cannot meet in person. Uh, as Nina said, I've, yeah, over the past years, built Catapult Ocean out of Norway, but with a global footprint. And we, we currently have a portfolio of 22 companies uh, that try to reconcile uh, the blue economy with a positive impact and, and taking care of the ocean and using it uh, sustainably. Um, we, our vision is a thriving ocean in harmony with economic uh, uh, economic um, uh, development. So really, how can we use the ocean in, in a good way at the same time as taking care of it? And to, to, to make it kind of concrete, I want to mention a few examples of projects out there. Um, one is Arc Marine, which is a UK-based company. Uh, they have developed reef cubes, uh, so you can actually you can build artificial reefs with these cubes, uh, and they target um, industries that are going to build offshore constructions, you know, offshore windmills, uh, offshore aquaculture farms, and all that. Normally, when you deploy those or build those projects, you would also have a negative impact on on the marine environment in those areas. Um, so what Arc Marine has done is to have these building blocks that you can use as subsea protection, and, and they will, you know, hopefully enhance or they will enhance the marine environment instead. Uh, so really, by you know, looking at of creative ways of of making sure that this the blue economy and building that uh, will actually can actually also have a positive impact on the environment. And I think that's is it is one part of also making sure that we can kind of couple sectors in the blue economy which is so important how can we have 
the green energy from the ocean at the same time as uh, we have a thriving ocean with with, with the with fish and then also aquaculture in a sustainable way and i think you know our marine is very, very concrete project it's, it's small brick but it's it's still uh, uh you know an important project uh remora is another one it's the costa rican company uh they focus on traceability of uh seafood uh wild caught seafood and they target small scale uh fishermen that cannot afford the the other uh certifications uh, so they have a technology that uh, with this, uh, with a vessel monitoring system that enables the fishermen to show that they've actually fished outside the marine protected areas and they they also have coupled it with a smart scale that can scan the fish, say that this is this is a species you're allowed to fish, it's the right size, and, and so on. And then the fishermen can prove that they've actually caught the fish uh, in a sustainable way, and then uh, they can sell it to more maybe high-end markets that want to pay a premium for that fish. So you actually, you know, increases the value of the catch for the local fishermen that are often also quite vulnerable and uh, also by sustainable fishing. So I think, you know, those are some examples and I want to have a third one that kind of builds a bit upon what Basim uh, said. Um, we, we have also invested in Norwegian company, Brim Explorer, and they have developed a, it's a hybrid uh, tourist ship that is, um, you know, can go 10 hours fully electric, take people out. Uh, and their vision here is to make people fall in love with the ocean. And it's designed in a way where, uh, where they want people to, you know, <laughs> to really appreciate, you know, the pristine seas. Uh, and they use technology to do it, to bring the sounds of the ocean into the ship. And their ambition here is that people, all these tourists that come and visit the Arctic in Norway and maybe elsewhere when they expand, will go back home, have learned something and want to really uh, take care of it. So it's actually what Hugo and Vasim uh, talked about. Uh, so I think this telling these stories about the concrete projects out there, uh, out there. the, the uh, ocean, the, uh, ocean uh, yeah, started back uh, quite nice started compared to the race, uh, but nevertheless, we, it's really thriving at the moment, and we have this project in front of the investment or private customers trying to facilitate. Thank you, Marne, and three very concrete uh, and inspiring examples of, uh, of initiatives, uh, all pushing the uh, blue economy forward. Uh, now, you're representing uh, the uh, investors or the investment community uh, on this uh, panel. How do you see uh, investor appetite uh, in the ocean space developing, and has there been a change as a result of uh, COVID-19? Uh, I see definitely increasing appetite. Uh, I can refer to a, a, a report by Credit Suisse that was published uh, in January, I think this year, where they asked 350 investors um, and more than 90% of they, them said that they thought the blue economy, sustainable blue economy is investable and interesting. So there's definitely appetite, uh, but, but the proof is in the pudding, right? So we have to, you know, even if you're interested, you have to actually put money to it. And I, I think with, with investors I talk to, mainly in Europe, uh, we we see a lot of interest here. We see more investors adding the blue to their uh, fund strategy. And we see a lot of the family offices, especially here in Norway, that has a link to the ocean, uh, see the need to, to invest in, in sustainable solutions, new technologies, there's a generational shift happening at the moment as well, where kind of next generation, they come on board, they are more interested uh, in, in ventures, new technologies uh, and, and, and the impact uh, and want to, 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 to push this change. So I'm, I'm very positive. And I think uh, during these special past months, I've had a lot of good discussions with investors that really now see the need to refocus, diversify away from some of the old, uh, uh, or more dirty businesses and focus more on 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 the green and the blue shift uh, and also the ESG funds have also you know been more resilient in these past months so I think that we, we see really uh, that this is the way forward and um, and this is just a taste of what what's to come if you do not handle the, the main the really big challenges we have uh, after COVID. 
Thank you, Martin. Um, and uh, one of the examples uh, that Martin uh, mentioned was involved in traceability, uh, which is, of course, an elegant segue over to our next and final uh, panelist. Uh, Mr. Rupert House is the CEO of MSC, the Marine Stewardship uh, Council, and has been so for an impressive 16 years. During uh, this time, the MSC program has grown uh, substantially to have over 16% of global landings uh, certified uh, sustainable and over 400 fisheries uh, around the world. I guess that's really uh, the blue economy in, in practice. And Rupert is not just uh, passionate about the ocean, uh, but is also a qualified chartered accountant who can read a balance sheet and profit and loss account, just for a fun fact uh, towards the end. Uh, but Rupert, uh, what role does a certification schemes like the MSC play in shaping the blue uh, economy? And do you have, have some uh, inspirational success stories that you can share uh, with us? Uh, Nina, thank you. Um, I'm just marvelling at fun facts, including accounting. That was a very long time ago, and I don't normally tell people about that. Um, where to begin? Um, I think the world is at a crossroads. We all recognise that. COVID has come along. There's no vaccine. We're not emerging into a post-COVID world. We're emerging into a COVID present world. And everything has changed. And I think why I'm optimistic is there is a sense of urgency and I think a growing sense of we must build back better and scale solutions. So yes, MSC is one tool in the toolbox that I feel very passionately about can help catalyze and incentivize through the engagement of our partners around the world, from the fishing industry to the market, to increasingly with governments, we can create the right incentives to bring fisheries into a third party scientific assessment process where many make improvements to meet that standard. That's part of it. And just sort of echoing the uh, state sector's comments this morning, um, or earlier, sorry, it feels, feels like this morning. Um, I, I don't think there, there is a sustainable blue economy if we don't fix fishing. It is the last global industry harvesting a wild resource for food. It meets 20% of humanity's animal protein needs and perhaps you know, the majority for 3 billion people on this planet. We love fish, low carbon, uh, potentially renewable source of protein. But if you look at the statistics, the trends are still moving in the wrong direction. So the latest FAO report that only just came out uh, has, has stated that about 34% of stocks are fished at unsustainable levels. That's a threefold increase since 1970. We're going from 7 billion to 10 billion. So it's essential that we manage what we've got sustainably to make sure we get that added sustainable protein for a hungry world, but also for the broader blue economy, 5 million fishing vessels out there fishing, 50 million directly employed, perhaps 10 times that in, in the blue economy as a whole. So there's a huge win here, I think. So MSC has a part to play, countless examples with the 400 fisheries of fisheries entering assessment, uh, the, People might not be aware, but the, the whole idea is that it's an independent scientific assessment of that fishery against stock health, environmental impacts, and the quality of the management regime. They're assessed by independent scientists. Uh, if they meet the standard with full traceability, they can use the label in the marketplace. That empowers all of us as individuals to make informed choices and reward those fishers that are fishing sustainably and responsibly, but most importantly, to create the incentives for others to come forward. So uh, the last 20 years of MSC's history has shown it can work, but it won't work on its own. We need the governments to create the right enabling environment. And that's why I'm such a fan of the CBOS initiative that Carl has mentioned, where those leading companies have committed to work with governments to help create the policy reforms that are needed. We need businesses to embrace sustainability in every sense, to decarbonize and all of us as consumers to, to, to uh, do the right thing. Just ending very quickly on, on a practical example. South African hake, uh, a fishery entered assessment. It was viewed as quite a controversial fishery. Uh, the assessment process actually revealed there wasn't one stock of hake. There were two, one was overfished, and the fishery was also uh, responsible for the death of 10,000 seabirds every year through uh, interactions of you know, magnificent birds like wandering albatross with the warps for the trawl lines. 
Over their time of engagement, uh, working with WWF South Africa, improving relations with the re regulator, building relations with the commercial sector, using MSC as a tool, they fixed the problems. Both stocks are now managed at sustainable levels. That bird bycatch reduced by 90%. And critically, new markets won that have helped protect 12,000 much needed, main, mainly female processing jobs on land. So that's, that's what we're trying to do. I'm trying to be succinct in a, in a few minutes to give you a flavor of what we're about. But the, the overarching message is COVID has given us a chance for the great reset, as the World Economic Forum are calling it. We, it's a once in a century opportunity for, for everybody to work better together and deliver solutions at scale. I think you did really well, uh, Rupert. So thank you so much for that. And the Hake example is obviously uh, a brilliant one uh, in terms of uh, the role that certification can play in improving the sustainability of uh, fisheries. But of course, as you point out, certification is only one uh, tool in the toolbox and we definitely need more. Uh, and the state secretary also pointed uh, to the importance of science and of course, listening to uh, scientific advice in um, sustainably managing uh, fisheries. Um, but this isn't necessarily happening all over uh, the world. And there are also still huge gaps in our knowledge and scientific assessments of fisheries. Um, Carl, is this something that the CBOS initiative can and will also be looking into? And what other tools in the toolbox do you see uh, in addition to what has been mentioned. Yes, I, I really hope that uh, we, we, we call it stewardship rather than conservation or, or restoring, because, um, because unless uh, humanity starts to become stewards of our own future on the planet, it simply won't work for 9 to 11 billion people. And, and uh, I can say that because it's a pretty strong scientific consensus about that. And as you know, we don't have super much time either because of the climate issue which sort of challenges the whole stability of the planet that uh, allows us to live here. So, uh, so, so it's, it's definitely not tweaking lit a little bit at the margin on the economic way of doing things right now. It's really, it's really about taking on this um, connection between people who can be in, the, in ecosystems and, and be stewards of them and, and link them, for example, to urban centers. And, and when I listen to some of the other presenters here, Jürgen Vasim, and you mentioned the tourism, tourism part. I think that the tourism could be could, could create a lot of incentives for local communities to really be, be good stewards and have dignity and respect for being good stewards of the ecosystems. In, in, instead of being shifted into into producers uh, in, in a sort of efficiency chain of economic production. Uh, so, and I think that that's what we see now. When we work with, we don't only not only work with with the seafood companies. I work with a lot of big companies here in Sweden, like you know, I don't know if you know companies like Atlas Copco, H and M, and many of those. They are they are even truck companies like Scania. They they are changing their whole approach now from sort of linear supply chain to what they call their own ecosystems of, of much more dynamic. Uh, connections between uh, between how they produce their things and, and they start to build also capacity to live with changing circumstances now uh, in, in in that in that effort so uh, so I think I think what's what we hope with CBOS is now to take the, the uh, as I said we, we're sort of cleaning up the act first and actually was one was CEO who said that you you can't talk about these things unless you cleaned up your own act because uh, that's uh, sort of immoral to some extent, and and, uh, and and now we're moving into stewardship, both of people and ecosystems together. Because in my mind, there are no ecosystems uh, and uh, without people, uh, at, at least not uh, maybe maybe directly, but indirectly, all ecosystems are shaped by us in one way or the other. And it's uh, we we are the biggest force of evolution right now on Earth. Actually, we are we are we have created completely new environments for all organisms including big mammals in the sea, including fish stocks. You know, they're migrating to different places now uh, and so on and so forth. So, so and, and that of course requires that we, we also mobilize the information technology and, and create good ways of understanding and monitoring these changes to be able to act on them actually. So we just won't tram tramble in the dark. So I think that stewardship approach is really central 
uh, not at the margin, but at, at the very profound level of of becoming having capacity and and competence to uh, to uh, imp improve the health of the oceans and secure seafood production, secure healthy waters, secure good coastal environments for tourism, and and, uh, and and make sure that those activities who before were really degrading the oceans stop doing that or stop being activities at all actually. So, so and, and I think uh, we start to see that shift, and, and I think it's promising with the sort of the whole the green green economy approaches we see you now coming up here in Europe, and, and 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 not only for energy but also for the broader system. I could talk yeah. for a, a long about stop there. <laughs> no, I think uh, there are a lot of uh, positive things happening out there, uh, and and as you rightfully point out, uh, humans are definitely. Uh, and uh, integrated an integral part of the ecosystems. Uh, although, interestingly enough, we're probably the only species on the planet so willingly uh, destroying our mere foundation for existence. Um, so, it's great to hear some positive examples from each of the panelists in terms of positive initiatives going on and po possible solutions uh, going forward. So we've touched a bit on finance, we've touched a bit on science, uh, market-based uh, solutions, um, and also the role of local uh, communities. But one of the important uh, things that we also need to touch on is, of course, the role of decision makers and, uh, and what specific recommendations that uh, should be formulated towards them uh, to further develop the sustainable blue uh, economy. Uh, so Hugo, uh, you've obviously spent a lot of time um, working uh, towards key decision makers. What uh, key recommendations would you like to see um, uh, following from this? And you're on mute. Uh, yeah, I think um, it, it's a really good question. Um, decision makers are always influenced by their constituents. Um, you know, here in the UK, the, the, of course, our members of parliament. Um, you know, it, we've, got, we've just had a really interesting um, review that's been released here, the Highly Protected Marine Areas Review by former MP Richard Bennion. Um, and, you know, that's the sort of radical thinking that I think we need to see introduced in this field. I think if we're um, if we're getting the public behind um, these sorts of initiatives and talking to decision makers and understanding them, uh, we can we can highly protect big swathes of our ocean, which then enables the, the sustainable blue economy in other parts of the ocean uh, with the sort of spillover effect um, and the sort of public consensus. So, so for me, we've got this this decade of, of ecosystem restoration. We've got the decade of ocean science um, that we're now at the start of. And I would like to see the public understanding connecting with radical decision sort of making um, and politicians willing to, to act fast. We've seen in the COVID-19 crisis that we can pivot on a dime. Big business, um, big government can actually make decisions very quickly and implement things very quickly. And that's the sort of speed we need to see for ocean recovery. Thanks, Hugo. Uh, no doubt uh, speed uh, is a key ingredient uh, in the way uh, forward. Uh, but you point to another important tool in the toolbox, which is, of course, uh, marine protected uh, areas. And I would like to ask you, uh, Wasim, uh, seen with, uh, with the tourism eyes, uh, what uh, is the importance of, of MPAs? And are you seeing positive effects uh, of established MPAs on, uh, on your tourism activities? Yeah, uh, you know, there are um, different uh, different elements to take in, into account when we go to uh, sensitive areas in the polar regions, in some islands, uh, in, in some um, specific uh, regions around the world. Uh, sometimes there, there is a lack of regulation. Sometimes uh, we need also to, to put uh, in place some rules with the local uh, authorities. Um, and uh, I can give you some example in the Indian Ocean. We were in the initiative of the environmental impacts uh, before uh, the, um, the design of the, the, the new uh, cruise itineraries. For example, we proposed to the authorities to 
perform environmental um, impact assessment uh, for the local areas, especially to um, uh, be be sure that we can we will not affect the the, the local biodiversity, the local ecosystem. Um, and now uh, we need, for example, as um, it exists for the big project in the World Bank in the, and the European banks, for example, to have um, like a model, like a specific uh, environmental impact assessment uh, tools. Uh, and for the 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 C project, it, this this tool uh, don't exist. So I think. Uh, we we can develop this this new drug and our company really uh, care about that and take um, um, pay attention about the the protection of the the ecosystems and the environment uh, in the sensitive areas. For example, in polar regions, uh, we um, we uh, adapt our itineraries uh, depending in the in the movement of the ices. Uh, and uh, we 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 prefer to not go where the uh, the ice uh, are are in place, and we prefer to uh, to modify our itineraries to be sure to preserve at the maximum these areas. Uh, it's not it's not very 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 easy, but we can we can uh, do be better uh, all together. I think. That is definitely true. Thank you so much, uh, Wasim. I mean, we can all improve, we can all do better, uh, but thank you all for sharing uh, some inspiring examples. Uh, the other workshop participants have obviously been waiting patiently, and I'm sure after listening to this initial discussion, uh, they have a ton of questions that they would like to, uh, to ask you. So I'm gonna hand back over to Lena, to uh, continue uh, the next part of the program with the discussion uh, session with uh, the other workshop participants. Thank you so very much to, to all of you, to our panel for a really great discussion. As Nina said, we will now open the floor to the audience, so who may want to ask a question. So, as we said, we um, ask you to, ask the, to use the questions box to submit your question. And if possible, if you could indicate to whom in the panel your question is addressed, that is applicable. In parallel, if you could also use the raise hand tool so that we can identify you quickly in the list of attendees. Um, we will announce the name of the person who may take the floor and unmute your microphone so that you can ask your question. Please keep in mind to introduce yourself and uh, please keep in mind to be as brief and to the point as possible as we would like to, to leave uh, the floor to as many people as possible. Thank you everyone for your collaboration. So I think that we have one uh, first question from Michel Barbier. Um, hi, um, so I'm Michel Barbier, I'm a scientist and I founded the Institute for Science and Ethics. So I'm really much uh, involved in developing um, activities and actions towards the sustainability of our ocean. Um, I had a question listening uh, from Hugo and, uh, and uh, Wasim. Have we thought about um, engaging the tourists into restoring ecosystems and define, design a new concept of uh, engaged tourism? You go. <laughs> Maybe I I can start if you like. Um, we have um, a lot of uh, scientists on board, and um, we have a lot of experiences on board of our ships. So we invited uh, different uh, scientists from different um, universities around the world, and we ask all the scientists to um, have. Uh, participation of the passengers to share this experience with the passengers. For example, when they, the, the 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 last two examples I can I can give you, uh, we had an experience with um, the the waves in Antarctica uh, for about two months, and all the um, all the the experience was shared 
with uh, with the passengers day by day, and they they participate in, in some experiences with the scientists. Um, we also had an experience for them to listen the uh, the to listen to the sea, listen to the seas, um, uh, the submarine uh, um, measurement um, for 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 the, um, the noises, uh, submarine noises, and uh, and passengers also participated to this kind of experiences. Uh, a lot of passengers now uh, are asking this kind of uh, this kind of uh, participation, and we created a, a foundation last year uh, to um, include this um, uh, this this kind of uh, projects and action with uh, with our passengers. So uh, we have a big project called uh, Ponon Forest. Ponon Forest is a conservation, natural conservation project with a big forest around the world. And every uh, time we go uh, in, in some new area, um, passengers can participate to reforest and can um, yeah, see the pro progress of this uh, action. So it's something new for us, but it's a, it's a really a, a good initiative, good idea. I would follow on uh, from that. Yeah, we've seen uh, sort of great examples about practical experiences people can have of restoring um, habitats and ecosystems. And I think this is coming into sharp focus um, in the in the marine environment. We're seeing more and more projects, uh, the replanting of mangrove forests with projects like the Sea Trees Initiative um, globally, you know, really important um, habitats for carbon sequestration, for the, the spawning and sort of nurseries of fish. Of course, globally, we're seeing people getting involved in beach cleans to tackle the inputs into our marine habitat with a sort of plastic pollution. We're seeing seagrass meadows being replanted. So I think there's a huge public appetite to be involved in protecting the spaces they love. And I think we're the, the leading edge of that at the moment. And we will see more and more development of that over this decade as people become citizen scientists, but also um, practical um, interventionists to, to really restore these places they love. Thank you so much. We have another question from Pablo Obregón. Uh, good Pablo. morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, first, uh, thank you very much for this wonderful uh, panel discussion. It's been really interesting to hear all of your insights. Uh, my question is uh, around this idea of, of the fact that we have limited resources uh, available to address major ocean challenges. Um, and so given sort of the, the depth of those issues, how do we balance or prioritize key issue areas, uh, both within an economic sector as well as between the economic sectors? Uh, just to give an example for tuna fisheries, uh, how do we simultaneously and adequately address environmental sustainability uh, including through certification schemes like MSC uh, and rating systems like Seafood Watch, uh, but also address social responsibility, uh, especially in cases where resources like funding, information, political, and enterprise will are limited. Thank you. Is that for me to kick off? <laughs> Great, great question. Thank you. Um, in, in terms of limited resources, when we look at look at what's been spent in terms of, you know, particularly OECD country responses to COVID, when we need the resources and the finances, it's there. In my own small country, the United Kingdom, we had a budget the day before uh, we decided to to start thinking about lockdown, where where 50 billion of expenditure was announced, and then in a matter of weeks. That's gone to 350 billion, and our national debt is now bigger than our national output. So governments find the resources when they need them. What we must do, though, is spend that money wisely because we're borrowing from our children and most likely their children as well. When you look at the level of indebtedness around the world and therefore, uh, of course, there's choices. It's the allocation of scarce resources to competing demands. But I think all investment should be guided by sustainability principles. 
you know, we need to decarbonize. If we don't fix carbon, we don't fix oceans. If we don't fix oceans, we don't fix carbon. So this needs back to the political leadership, the boldness uh, and the commitment and the partnerships. And, and the reason why I'm still on optimistic, despite the scale of the challenges, is we have a we have a route map. We have a plan. We have the SDGs, Agenda 2030, that 193 nations have signed up to. So now we need to deliver on that. So back to the to my fishy world, uh, the WTO have been discussing for 20 years the elimination of harmful subsidies. Why don't the national governments instruct their ambassadors just to do it? You know, this is what we need to do now. We're in 2020 now. We have less than 10 years to 2030, and we need to radically shift onto a more sustainable footing. On your second point, tuna fisheries, again, the power of the market and consumers, there's been a doubling of tuna fishery engagement in the MSC program. And indeed, one of the leading companies in um, CBOS, Dong Wan, through their engagement in CBOS, have entered all of their tuna fisheries into a transparent third party process. And some of those are now beginning to achieve certification. MSC is focused on ecological sustainability. You're touching on the social dimension, and that is a critically important area. There are issues of slave and bonded labor out in the oceans. There are issues of observers, sadly, you know, being murdered, uh, people you know, losing their lives. And it's an area that has to be tackled, and it can be tackled through the supply chain. It can be tackled through proper enforcement of monitoring, control, and surveillance requirements at the RMFO level. Uh, and again, it's, 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 it's one of the problems that we have to tackle if we are gonna collectively move onto a more sustainable system of production and consumption for everybody. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. We have another question from Maria Hatsiolos. Maria? One, two, three, three. Yes. We can hear you. Oh, great. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, this question is actually for for Maren Bauer, and um, I wanted to ask if there's some possibility for developing a sustainable blue economy index that would show up on various stock exchanges, and would help guide investors towards socially and environmentally sustainable blue business. I mean, this concept already exists in terms of green growth portfolios. Can we do something very specific for blue economy industries that would really take advantage of people's commitment to uh, using their money sustainably and help jumpstart uh, and support uh, better uh, use of ocean resources. Thank you so much for that question. I actually had that discussion last week with um, yeah, a couple of colleagues uh, <laughs> on, you know, yeah, on, on that. And I think, I mean, that's, yeah, we should we should all strive to 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 have uh, you know concrete ways of measuring the impact different type of companies have on 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 our planet you know and and some some of them are easier with you know co2 and, and so on and I, but i think what's really needed here is to find a, a common way of measuring the impact on in, in the blue economy or in in the ocean uh across kind of both investors and companies and all that and, and agree on you know the, these these are the ways that we measure that, uh, and and uh, and we've started you know, with capital ocean. We've started a bit with you know, but that's small scale. But all the companies we invest in, they report financial uh, results back that, but also impact. Uh, and uh, and I think there's definitely to to to, to define some you know common ways of, of doing that. Uh, and the, the end game. Would I think would would be fantastic to have that on, on on stock exchanges? You know, it could be ocean, could be you know several of the other SDGs to have some of that, so that you as an investor can, uh, you know, uh, have great, make fact based decisions on your investment. So it's it, it should be possible, right? We measure all other things, but it's it's about agreeing on a, a common way of measuring it, uh, and yeah. Okay, thank you so much. I think we have a question from Natalie Hilmi. Natalie, you should be unmuted. Natalie, can you hear us? Are you able to speak? Mm -hmm. 
Non. We will go. Okay, so let's see. Do can Philip Clays have a question? Has a question? We will. Uh, sorry, bear with us for a minute. We will yeah. identify where yes. Philip. Hello. You be... Hello. You hear me? Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. We can hear you. We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, we have some issues here. Sorry about that. Now, Philip, can you hear us? And can you please ask your question? Yes. Hello, my name is uh, Philip Kleis, and I have a restaurant in Belgium, uh, the Oakman, and I'm also the founder of the Northy Chefs. And my question is, what is the role of the gastronomy and chefs to protect our sea? <laughs> who, who is that one for? <laughs> I'm happy to answer it. I can have a short one of that because we actually, we're actually working on something we call the gastronomic landscapes, uh, which with a lot of Swedish chefs here actually. And, and, and uh, the idea there is that chefs uh, really are uh, becoming knowledgeable of a lot of ingredients and a lot of new types of species and also how they can be sustained and used in a sustainable way. And I think that that way of looking at things could easily be applied to coastal areas and so also, and, but I don't think it has yet actually. So it's a, it's a fairly new space i think and you may, may know more about the, the marine one than i do and they, of course you have a tradition there as well i guess with oyster farms and things like that but but they're really looking at, at more as an integrated approach to support stewardship of, of whole ecosystems that produce produce the food i think is is a very interesting way forward so so we talk about it in the concept of gastronomic landscapes or seascapes let me quickly jump in um you know, firstly, good luck with, with reopening. Uh, food sector has been devastated by COVID, um, food service sector. I, I think a restaurant chefs have a pivotal role to play because of the education. So by demanding sustainable seafood choices for you to prepare and cook and be creative and, and to present to, to your customers, you're telling a story, you're connecting your customers to the sea. And therefore, you know, I think there's a moral and ethical duty to demand that that fish has come from a well-managed and sustainable stock in the same way that all of us as individuals, when we're buying fish, whether it's from the fishmonger or the supermarket, we should be asking those questions because it's those signals back down the supply chain that make people say we must operate sustainably. MSC is just one of several schemes that can provide a third party assurance. But the critical thing is asking those questions and getting that assurance and therefore rewarding those fishers who are doing the right thing in terms of stewardship of our common and shared ocean resources. I'll come and visit you when uh, we get out of lockdown. Sounds good. <laughs> okay. Great. We have a question from Francois Oulier. We will try to see if your microphone is working. You said that you may have a problem. We'll we try. see. We'll try. And if not, we will read your question. It's not working. No. Okay, we will read your question. Uh, François Oulier, Ifremer would like to ask the following question to the panelists. What kind of science do you expect to reconcile blue economy and sustainable management of the ocean? What kind of new knowledge? Which data? What kind of uh, scientists, expertise, etc. Anyone wants to take that on? Nina. Nina, would you like to have a go? Holding back, given that I was uh, just uh, leading the panel uh, discussion. Uh, but I think, I mean, there's obviously a lot of knowledge uh, out there already, a lot of data that is currently not being uh, put to good use. So I think uh, first and most importantly, it's of course making sure that the knowledge that we already have is actually being used and is being made more readily available to decision makers 
and to those that really are not um, listening to the data, uh, abiding by the science uh, and making um, distinct dist decisions that go uh, counter to what the science and the data is showing us. Then, of course, it's important to also understand that even though we know a lot about the ocean, uh, we've still only mapped probably about 5% uh, of uh, what the ocean has and holds. Uh, so uh, increasing our efforts to gain new knowledge uh, about the ocean, the impacts that the human activities are currently having on uh, the ocean, and probably in particular, uh, the long-term impacts of um, climate change and ocean acidification uh, is, in my mind, uh, probably the most critical uh, thing that we need to understand better and also understand how we can manage fisheries in light of climate change and ocean acidification that we simply have no idea of what the long-term effects will be. Can I quickly add one thing? I think youth science is always good, but we cannot allow governments to use the lack of data or the requirements for new science to delay action. So I look back to the IPCC report on, on oceans in the cryosphere. They know, thousands of scientists have looked into this, that at, that at a 1.5 degree warming world, we lose 90% of our corals. Two degrees, they're all gone. Profound implications for food security and local livelihoods. And humanity is heading to three degrees and beyond that. So we've got a lot of science now, and we can start making some decisions based on that. But clearly, there are scientists say that we, you know, we do need new data. But let's build on what we've got and still be bold in decision making and implementation. Yeah, I very much agree with Rupert there. And, but and I would also argue for more of transdisciplinary science, where science join forces with uh, with uh, business or practice. And, and collaboratively come up with solutions. And, and, and uh, most likely the world will be much more of a moving target than we have been spoiled with, at least during our lifetimes. And, and uh, so we have to be much more adaptive. We have to be much more capacity to deal with these changing conditions. Uh, Rupert mentioned the really big ones on the, the climate, but, but, but there will be many other ones as well. So, so I think the rule of science has one key stakeholder, you could say, in collaborative efforts, uh, trying to keep track of and, and deliver the best of scientific understanding. So we don't do a lot of meaningless work, actually, because we can do a lot of things, but some of them completely wasted because it will have no effect. So, so uh, that, that's, uh, that's my mission for the future. May and I think yeah. also my point to Carl uh, is to uh, improve collaboration uh, across disciplines uh, and across industries so that we can learn from great examples uh, like the CBOS initiative for example how can that be replicated and scaled for for other industries what is it that we can learn from that um, and uh, and making sure that the knowledge that we have is translated into concrete solutions because a lot of the time the decision makers or key business leaders don't necessarily know how to act uh, on what the science is, is telling us. So we need to uh, be much clearer on uh, the solutions that are needed, work with tech startups uh, and industry to make sure that the, the uh, solutions are developed. And then, of course, making sure that we're investing uh, money into it. And I think Rupert's point uh, was also really uh, important that money is available if we need to. And if there's one thing that we definitely need, it's to invest uh, in uh, the sustainability of the ocean. Hey, hey. Okay. Thank you. We have time uh, for one last question. Uh, Andre Poljak. We'll try to unmute you. Yeah, I think I'm unmuted. Um, if everybody can hear me, thank you. My question was uh, targeted to Marin and Carl about the issue of intellectual property and the transfer of marine technology. If you think about the global south and the capacities therein and the lack of uh, human capacities and technological development, how can you foster a true blue bioeconomy without uh, true intellectual property rights uh, established and uh, marine technology transfer followed as IOC says. Thank you.
Maureen, you want to start or? Yeah, again, of She's course, what you're, what you're raising is, a, is a, an enormously complex and, and highly important uh, topic, and especially given the escalating inequality that we have seen, and also that's uh, escalating even much more now uh, during the Corona crisis. You know, so uh, th there's no easy answer, but uh, of course, it boils down to governance system, government and governance systems, and the lack of that actually. And there's been a lot of attempts in many other around many other conventions to try to enhance that capacity so so uh, it's difficult to come up with a good solution but um, ideally some type of transparent uh, international new form of organization that would uh, guarantee ethical and, uh, inequality principles uh, in, in sort of north south or whatever cut you want to use describing that that tension i think would be extremely important um, i remember in the biodiversity convention uh, there was something called the incremental cost approach and we have the, uh, some organizations that are dealing with that uh, but, but it's definitely not sufficient and, and and the issue is is extremely important extremely important i think about the, the urbanization, urbanization trends and everything that's happening right now so so you, you're right on there in in highlighting a major challenge Yes, it's it's a it's a complex topic, but I would also like to highlight that even though we see a lot of um, exciting, you know, in deep technologies coming out of you know the northern part of the globe, there's a lot of really uh, promising startups and technologies being developed in other parts of the world as well. And I really see that. You know, we we looked at more than 1,500 uh, impact-driven ocean startups from more than 80 countries so far from all over the world and what's really is great to see here is the level of engagement and creativity from other parts of the world where people feel some of these issues really much more on, on, on their body than we necessarily do uh, i'm sitting in norway and you know it, it's different so the kind of motivation for some of the founders elsewhere to to build new solutions and also the access to like resources in a different way virtually these days uh is is uh, a promising start a start i think um and some of the really great founders we see are people that you know come from other parts of the world and that really feel the issues and have even stronger motivation maybe to solve some of these challenges so but we have to, to work out how to do this and it's, it's not only in the ocean space of course it's across all uh, all sectors Thank you so very much. I'm sorry we have many great questions actually coming in all the time, but we will we will have to to move on now. So thank you again, everyone, for your excellent questions. And uh, we would like to give the floor back to Nina just for one minute for some if you have some final thoughts about today's discussion. Nina, I just wanted to give a huge round of uh, applause and thank you to our uh, excellent uh, panel of ocean enthusiasts. Um, emphasizing really clearly uh, both that the ocean is in trouble, uh, but also that it holds uh, huge potential in terms of uh, a sustainable blue uh, economy. Also highlighting it with some very concrete uh, examples, ranging from the CBOS uh, initiative to sustainable tourism, the involvement of local uh, communities, increasing appetite for investing in ocean tech startups, um, and um, and of course, the role of, uh, of initiatives like MPAs, uh, certification, uh, and, uh, and essentially listening to uh, science. Uh, some key words and takeaways are, of course, uh, speed, scale, science, and stewardship as key ingredients as moving us forward. And I think uh, most importantly, um, the ocean needs large investments to resolve some of the uh, challenges that we are facing, and the money is available uh, if we just um, decide that this is important enough, and it definitely is. Thank you so very much, Nina, and the panel uh, for this great panel. Uh, we will now hear some closing words from Mr. Wenden and Mr. Kalkenjuk. 
Thank you very much, Lina. Uh, Mr. State Secretary, Excellencies, dear speakers, dear friends of the Monaco Blue Initiative, we couldn't conclude today this third workshop and last workshop of the Monaco Blue Initiative without telling you how pleased we are that we managed to host a digital edition of the Blue Initiative. It was indeed a strong wish expressed by His Serene Highness Prince Albert II of Monaco, by his foundation and by the Oceanographic Institute to ensure that this sound platform for dialogue and exchange could continue despite the pandemic. The MBI was launched more than 10 years ago and it was important to continue in this specifically in this year, which was meant to be a decisive year for the ocean and for biodiversity. We believe that this first ever online di and digital MBI was a success. And thanks to you, thanks to our distinguished speakers, thanks to our moderators, panelists, and of course the MBI secretariat. Thank you all greatly for your remarkable contribution. Thank you also to all the attendees that connected over the last month. You were more than 200 to participate in this online MBA. So thank you once again to all of you. These workshops managed to cover some key topics that were discussed um, in the past weeks. And important recommendations emerged, uh, which we hope will be taken into account in the high-level um, ocean meetings to be held in the following month and the coming year. From the position of marine protected areas in the international negotiations to the importance of community involvement of, um, in MPA management and the sustainable blue economy today, we have had three sessions full of sound messages, engagements, and concrete examples and ideas to stand up to the vast challenges which lies ahead of us in this reset world. Through the conversations that we had, we can maybe highlight some salient points. Um, firstly, that obviously COVID-19 crisis um, is very linked, intimately linked to the degradation of the general environment, itself connected to anthropogenic activities. However, in many countries, due to the uh, worrying sanitary, economic, social and financial crisis, the protection of the environment will probably not become a priority in many parts of the world. It may then be more than ever important to make sure that marine protected areas, for instance, and other integrative conservation measures are placed at the center of international discussions. Secondly, and as highlighted by His Serene Highness in his introduction speech and by many keynote speakers and panelists, our main collective goal should be the protection of at least 30% of land and ocean by 2030, with a substantial part under strict protection, of course. A third point would be, and it was expressed during our second workshop, that nonetheless and ultimately uh, we will need 100% sustainable use uh, of the global ocean, of course. Another interesting point that was raised is probably science to education, science to decision-making process, which should be deepened, which should be strengthened. And the last point that was raised today is obviously that the pandemic has clearly proven that we can no longer work in silos, that we need collective action and immediate collective action. The pandemic has also um, is also calling for the implementation and leveraging positive solutions that already exist, positive solutions that are part of green or blue economies, uh, such as ecotourism, sustainable fisheries. But without further ado, I would like to give also the floor to uh, Robert Calcagno, the CEO of the Oceanographic Institute. Thank you for hosting us today in person, and thank you for having participated along with the Foundation in this adventure. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much, Olivier. Now it's my turn. Uh, today, final sessions on the blue economy show of concrete examples of the commitment of economic actors to ocean protection. Uh, we really welcome the efforts of the private sector uh, to create this ocean-friendly strategy. And uh, today, 
I would like, we would like to convey a very clear message of engagement. We will be there, not only Olivier and myself, but Monaco, the principality of Monaco will be uh, there and will support such proposals, such positive initiatives. And we will help ensure that your efforts are known to the decision makers and also to the general public. Uh, in this spirit, and to some the topic of the blue economy, that the 12th edition of the Monaco Blue Initiative will be held on the 21st and 22nd of March 2021, hopefully, if the pandemic allows. Uh, we count on you all to help us identify champions of the sustainable blue economy who will be able to testify to their commitment and the success stories, but also difficulties and lessons learned. Thank you in advance for your suggestion. This is really an official call for proposal. Please answer and give us proposal suggestion. Now, there is still a long way to go to make the blue economy truly sustainable. We need to confess that. The ability of different actors to put their ideas on the table, recognizing different points of view and finding, comp uh, finding compromise will be critical. And uh, for such exchanges, the know-how developed by what I call or what we can call sustainability science uh, will be really essential and uh, for that i really refer to francois Oulier, uh, last question and and the discussion between uh, nina rupert and uh, and carl who, who knows what actually is uh, sustainable uh, uh, science it is uh, really necessary that we we all uh, scientists, but also entrepreneur, uh, decision maker, are, are able are able to progress and and to work transponderly or transdisciplinary, as you mentioned, uh, Nina, and also holistically. And as we did uh, this afternoon, that we are able to consolidate a very robust uh, scientific analysis and advice which will be palatable to entrepreneurs and policy makers. This is really important. We have plenty of data. Of course, we, we, we miss also data, but we need to, to be able to integrate this, uh, this new level of understanding of, or, and advice. Uh, I remember maybe, Nina, your conclusion, and I will uh, say your four S, if I understand well, speed, scale, science and, and stewardship. This is very important. And we therefore call for those discussions uh, to ramp up in the following weeks and months. And we count on the commitment of all of you, all our partners. Uh, we are all aware of the very busy ocean agenda ahead. Dear friends, uh, despite the difficult context of this pandemic, uh, we have noticed during this workshop that your efforts and commitment remain intact and even strengthened, should I say. On behalf of His Serene the Prince of Monaco, his foundation, Prince Albert II Foundation, and the Oceanographic Institute, we would like to extend a sincere thank you for your tireless work to protect our ocean. And we really do hope to meet you again in Monaco for the next edition of the Monaco Blue Initiative. So remember the date, 21st and 22nd of March, 2021. Uh, with this, I would like really to thank uh, the Secretariat for their really good organization skills. You did a terrific job. And I think on behalf of everything around the table, I would like to, to thank you. And now I give you the floor back to you for the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Wenden, Mr. Calcagnon, for these very nice words. Before wrapping up, we just wanted to inform you that we will soon be adding various products from these three sessions to the MBI website, such as the traditional MBI summaries. 
um, and meeting coverage of the IASD, the International Institute for Sustainable Development, will be soon uh, available too, as well as short uh, video highlights. We will make sure to inform you all, of course, when these products are available. Friends and colleagues, the last workshop of this Digital Monaco Blue Initiative is coming to an end. Thank you again to our fantastic keynote speakers, moderators, panelists, and the participants for being part of this adventure, bringing your perspectives and ideas to the table from across multiple time zones. Thank you for that and areas of expertise. Thank you once more also to Rolex for the continued support to the MBI. It has been a true pleasure. I know I can speak for both Pierre and I, um, when I say that it has been our really a pleasure for us to facilitate these, these workshops. Don't hesitate, finally, to get back to us with any questions or suggestions you have, may, may have. Um, and please help us spread the messages from this MBI using the hashtag MBI2020. We hope to see you in Monaco in March next year for the 12th edition of the MBI. And merci beaucoup and take care. Bye.